Thank you for having us all in today to talk about housing and all things related to housing because we're on topic. Um, I think I can speak for my colleagues as well and I say that we're really here to be partners with Vermont communities and liaisons between the needs of Vermont communities and the uh, supports that the federal government has to offer. So things that we listen for and work with people on or when there's a challenge with a federal agency that might uh, need a stronger advocate in DC to work it through the kinks or if there is a federal program that is really serving Vermont very well that if it was increased could serve Vermont even better. So we're really looking for those programs that are working well and supporting them and looking for those programs that a small fix could help them work better. Um, in doing so, I think we're really interested to hear from you today about the housing needs and solutions in your communities. And today and throughout the year, always interested in knowing what's happening around Vermont and, and how we can be here to help. So thank you all for having us in. I'm a field representative for Senator Leahy, and I cover housing, health, human services, education, and nutrition. Uh, so certainly not an expert on anything, but a generalist on, on most things. <laughs> And as we were talking about how to divide up what we're going to talk about today, I usually start with a broad brush overview of, of mostly the money issues. Senator Leahy is the vice chair of the Senate Preparations Committee, and so does a lot of the work, focuses a lot on how to fund those programs and keep them working in Vermont. So as we think about the federal foot programs that are really working in the state well to help our downtown, to help our rural areas, and develop housing. Um, Senator Lee is a strong supporter of the HOME program that's so well administered through the HCB, uh, the Community Development Block Grant program that's so well administered through the state, um, and other programs including the National Housing Trust Fund that you're going to hear more about from Sheila in a little bit. Uh, He's a strong supporter of neighbor works. There's the homeownership development centers that are around the state. Vermont is so fortunate in its neighbor works partners in the way that they are geographically spread across the state and serving every community with both helping people access homeownership and in affordable housing development. Um, I want to touch on a big federal housing partner in Vermont that I feel sometimes flies beneath the radar, which is USDA Rural Development. It's a branch of the USDA that invests in community development. It's essentially a bank for rural America. It works everywhere outside of Burlington, essentially. And its largest, large piece of its lending portfolio is in housing. So this path in 2018, it uh, underwrote 65 loan uh, mortgages to Vermonters. It guaranteed another, another 328 mortgages across the state. And it also has a home repair program for very low income uh, homeowners. And that program is predominantly a loan program, but there is a grant component for very low income seniors, which is a very valuable program that uh, it's good to see that access. So we have folks in your community who are needing that home repair, USC Rural Development is a wonderful resource to connect them with to see if they can help out. And they're uh, one of the few federal agencies that has an outpost in here in Vermont, so very accessible, very easy to work with. Uh, seeing as Senator Leahy's on the Appropriations Committee, and I thought I would give a little high-level overview of the federal budget process for 2020. The President submitted his uh, budget proposal, and it doesn't look great for housing resources. Rural development, for instance, their loan and grant programs are all zeroed out. Um, the home and CDBG programs similarly are zeroed out. And if we look back at the last three years, that has been consistent with what the President has proposed, and those programs have been maintained uh, in 2018. The Home CDG programs saw increases, and home saw a little decrease in 2019. I believe not of a scale that's going to have a great impact here because Vermont has, it's a small state minimum state, uh, so small fluctuations don't impact what we get too greatly. 
Um, as we look forward to the 2020 budget, one of the challenges is that the uh, budget caps that were put in place years ago and lifted for the past two fiscal years come back into place. And I had in my notes what percentage that was going to be impact domestic spending. It would be a 9% uh, reduction in all in non-defense defense discretionary spending. So that's really, we would be seeing cuts across the board in these valuable federal programs. What needs to happen is that Congress needs to negotiate you know, new budget caps if they don't want to see those go back, that reduction come into place, and they're working on that right now. Um, since the president su submitted his budget proposal in on March 11, Congress is now working on putting together their appropriations bills, and that process is going to uh, hopefully be concluded at the end of September. But we know how that's worked in recent years, so. Senator Leahy is very committed to getting federal agencies funded on time for the end of the fiscal year and saw some success with that last year um, with a series of minibus funding bills going through uh, before the end of the fiscal year. The Labor Health and Human Services bill passed on time for the first time in 22 years. So that was a significant success, but we also saw uh, the remainder of the bills, seven bills, just pass last month. So mixed back there. Uh, so that is the high level overview of, of federal housing programs and, um, and the work we're doing with them. Some kind of examples of the more nitty gritty work that myself and my colleagues do. One of the things that we're looking at trying to address in the 2020 federal budget is the fair market rents for the state. HUD sets a fair market, what it believes is a fair market rent for the state, and that determines the reimbursement rates for the housing choice vouchers, the subsidies, also impacts development around the state. And in the past years, those uh, rents set by HUD have been going down, meaning that according to HUD's formula, rents have gotten less expensive in Vermont, which would be great, but I think that's different from everything we hear and know about the state and, and see in our other grant surveys and statistics. So Burlington uh, was especially impacted by this, and they were able to submit a private grant survey proving that no, rents actually haven't gone down, and had corrected the rents for the Burlington area. However, that survey cost $70,000, which is uh, really hard for the state to make that investment uh, mm -hmm. to correct a formula that HUD already has. So we're trying to, through the appropriations, report language, get HUD to acknowledge that their formula is not working around the country for rural areas around the country. And uh, I've been working closely with Vermont State Housing Authority and BHCB to look at ways to uh, amend or address that issue. So that's just one example of, of where our work kind of dovetails with the housing work here in the state. <clears throat> the, the last thing that I want to say is that Senator Leahy is a strong supporter of housing programs. He's always willing to go to bat for them. And one of the reasons why he is is because he knows housing is a challenge in Vermont and that affordable housing helps everybody in Vermont. The other reason is he knows how well these resources are deployed here. Vermont is so fortunate in the constellation of housing organizations we have, how they work together to really develop housing, help people into home ownership. And because he knows that those resources are going to be so well spent and so well invested in communities of need, he's willing to go to bat for them. So I just want to tip my hat to his hat to the housing organizations we have in the state. So we've heard from uh, organizations such as mm -hmm. Lamoille um, uh, County or Lamoille uh, Housing uh, Project and um, the uh, Champlain Housing Trust and such, and they gave these stellar reports about projects that they have implemented uh, with a bond that uh, we passed here last year, about $37 million or so. So one of the things that struck me was that these organizations are now in place to continue this really good work. But then on the Senate side here in Vermont, we're struggling with trying to follow up with another bond. 
So that's going to, that could leave a hole in some real progress we've been making on affordable housing and housing in general uh, throughout the state. And I'm just wondering if there's anything coming up on the federal side that might uh, address something like that. The housing bond certainly did an incredible job of leveraging federal resources. Yep. Yep. The programs that provide the bulk of the federal housing funding are large block grant programs that uh, are funded through complex formulas that are very hard and politically hard to change. So I, I don't see those ships moving fast enough to next year fill that gap, but they will be there should the state um, to mesh that investment and, and carry it forward. Any questions? Tom? Yes, thank you for coming. I mean, it's a question for all of you. Um, Good. <laughs> <laughs> right, housing is a huge concern, obviously, and I'm co-sponsor of a bill that is looking at vacant and abandoned buildings. This is an issue in Barrie as well as some other uh, Vermont communities. And concentrating on single family homes I've been walked away from basically and are just now going back to nature, if you will, <laughs> and serving no good. And trying to find a funding mechanism to get them rehabilitated up the code and then back on the market and and hopefully attracting more families into Vermont with some good housing. So is there anything in the federal program that would help with that? So you are the fourth person to talk to me about that specific issue well, I'm this glad week. You knew that. Um, <laughs> and from every, I've heard from Rutland, I've heard it from Wyndham County, I've heard from Burlington, I've heard from Barrett. Um, and I hope you'll hear from St. Albans, they have the same problem. <laughs> I think it's- You can throw her on the pile. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that across the state we do see, uh, we're, we, I believe we have one of the oldest housing stocks in the country, mm -hmm. and we have some hard winters that are not easy on our buildings, so it's certainly a need that um, there are, is a weatherization assistance program through the Department of Energy that does do some of that repair and rehab, USDA, rural development through their home repair grant that, and loan that's a little bit. But in terms of a big, bold program that's going to address that, I think we don't quite have the solution yet. What I've been hearing from around the state is uh, interest in the shared equity model uh, to, for an organization to put, and I cannot explain shared equity perfectly. You'll have to ask uh, Greta Torbia Champlain Housing Trust. Uh, she could do a better job explaining it. Uh, but what I've been hearing from Housing Vermont and neighbor works organizations around the state is the idea of putting up front investment in these homes that would be matched by the homeowner and then the home would be assumed into the shared equity portfolio so it would be perpetually affordable. Um, which I think is a really neat and interesting idea. I don't know the federal mechanism to fund it at this point, but certainly interested to hear about it from you as well and keep our on um, thinking about it and talking about it until we find a program that can work. Thank you, um, Representative Byron and then Representative Clacky. So uh, kind of in the same thread, the same thing as Representative Walsh, uh, but with more of a focus on weatherization. Mm -hmm. um, again, some of the oldest ones housing stock, if not the oldest in the country. Um, biggest impact that we can have on people's home costs is through heating, mm -hmm. as well as climate impact. Mm -hmm. And we're experiencing a serious underfunding of those programs here through things like heat squad and a multitude of other aspects. Whether it's credits to homeowners when they put forward the money themselves, et cetera. And are there any federal programs that can help fill that void, given the conversations around climate impacts and trying to help out lower income individuals. So it's the, the weatherization assistance program through the Department of Energy, I believe, that does provide funding to the uh, community action agencies to run those weatherization programs for very low income Vermonters. But I think the need is more than those yes, programs are able to address. And also one of the challenges with that is that's so targeted on weatherization and sometimes there's other um, other needs in the home, like fixing the foundation, that it's hard to invest in weatherization when you have these other structural needs. So we do need a more flexible uh, funding source that will do that. USDA also has a uh, housing preservation grant that I believe NEDO in the Northeast Kingdom, SEVCA in Wyndham, <laughs> and I um, can't remember all the other grant recipients off the top of my head. I can access that funding 
probably 300,000 across the state. And that is useful because they pair it with their weatherization program, but it's able to address uh, the other structural issues with the homes. So okay. that program is, is addressing that, but it's just you know, I, 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 the program side. I'm talking about more like expanding the financial capacity yeah. within those programs yeah. because the need yeah. is far mm -hmm. outweighing the mm -hmm. volume. <laughs> And that's what I'm hearing from a lot of people. I mean, working Vermonters, older Vermonters, I mean, here again, is old inventory, leading heat, you know, the, the, the cost of, the upfront cost of, it, of, of doing it, they understand the long term benefits of climate impact and cost impact, but it's coming up with that money to like match or just do the program. Yeah. So, I guess it's just more of a. Well, one of the state sheriff's bills came out of Ways and Means yesterday with about a half a million dollars less than what was um, asked for in the, in, the, in the funding bill that we had going. So um, it's, it's trickling down here. John. Well, I, I'm so grateful to Senator Pence for being on the appropriation, saving lots of things for a lot. Um, it's not a housing thing, but. Again, in this budget, the arts, the humanities, the libraries, and public television have zeroed out for the third year. I know the senator has made sure that those things remain, but that would have a catastrophic effect in my law because our Department of Libraries gets 40% of its budget from Washington. So that would decimate libraries. The Arts Council gets a matching grant from the NEA of almost $700,000. That would be quite the Humanities Council is on a five hundred thousand dollars match, so that would be cool. And you know, from all the public television, we do substantial amount of million dollars. So it would be for a small state. And, and every year the senator saved it, and, uh, along with many other things. But I just want to send a great note of appreciation mm -hmm. for all that he's done and, and works across the aisle and make sure this is happening. But Let's not forget those tiny little things in the big huge issues too, because it's, it would be enormous for that. Certainly would. And he sees it across the state communities. And the arts have a huge impact on economic development here. And yes. that's, that's something that's always the front of foremost in his mind when he thinks about the value of investing in these arts institutions. Yeah. One question that uh, you asked us before we came in was about uh, investment outside of Chittenden County, and I just wanted to call up a part of USD rural development. There's a set aside for the Northeast Kingdom that allows for housing investment in a uh, special set aside of housing investment in the Northeast Kingdom and also uh, investment in the arts through rural business development grants, which, contrary to their name, actually go to support nonprofits that are going to generate economic activity. Um, so that is one example where there is targeted federal resources outside of uh, Chittenden County, and that's a program that the Senate uh, included in the 2000 Farm Bill and has supported ever since. And it brings between four and eight million into the kingdom each year. What agency? USDA Rural Development. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And, and how does that filter into the Northeast Kingdom? Do you have any idea? <laughs> anyway, back in Vermont. Yep. Um, it, so it, what it does is it creates a special set aside within a number of USDA rural development programs. One is a multifamily housing development program. So uh, Rural Edge or the Memorial Housing Trust, when developing housing in the Northeast Kingdom, has a separate lo uh, loan uh, pot of money that they can go to. It's a 1% development loan. Rural Edge, New, Newport. Rural Edge is in Newport. It's based in Lindenville. Yeah. And they're the primary nonprofit developer across the kingdom. So each year they do one or two properties Great. using that funding source. Cool. And one of the things that we're trying to do is ensure that rental assistance can be tied to that. But that's, uh, that's not a battle. We're working on it. Okay. <laughs> So no other questions. One more thing, slightly off the reservation here, but connected to housing. I was at Elder Vermonters Caucus this morning. I was at the Crestbury Care Center on uh, Monday morning for breakfast. And Medicare reimbursement is not taking care of our senior citizens who are in residential care or nursing homes. Mm -hmm. They're receiving about half of what it costs to keep a, a resident in the Crestbury Care Center. 
and they're teetering on the edge. And I don't know what we can do about it, but they haven't had an increase in 10 years in their Medicaid reimbursement. And spend downs are happening faster because their private rates are now raised to a point where more residents are now becoming eligible for Medicaid and going on to Medicaid. And it's just you tip the balance. And I just wanted to throw that in there because it's been on my mind. Certainly, it's certainly. <laughs> and it's sort of housing connected. <laughs> we hear a lot about, and I might let Kevin speak a little bit more to that. Okay, so great. Greater depth great. knowledge okay. in Medicare <laughs> okay. than I do. Thanks very much, Polly. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Sheila is next. Welcome, Sheila. Sheila is an old friend of mine, a neighbor of my brother down in Rygate. I am. I am. And, uh, she's here uh, for uh, Senator Sanders' office. And um, do you, would you like another go around the table for you? I documents? think I can remember everybody. <laughs> okay. Um, and I have several old friends sitting yeah. out here. No and doubt. Okay. A little intimidated by two of them over there. The, the real uh -oh. experts, Earhart and Jen. <laughs> They will correct you. And there's Sarah from the network. How are you? Nothing. Good. Good. Um, Good. Welcome. I, thank you. I am an outreach representative for Senator Sanders. I cover housing, women's issues, early childhood, disabilities, and I'm missing one, um, poverty. Um, so I have a big portfolio. I also run the St. Johnsbury office, and I'm over there all by myself. So um, I do I answer the phone, etc. But I'm his, I'm his eyes and ears in the Northeast Kingdom, and all the talk about the USDA, etc. I was at the Gilman Senior Center last week, and if anybody has been there, it is. A poverty stricken yeah. little town with and this senior center is just you can't believe there's actually a building there. Yeah. You go in and there's it's warm and welcoming. There's food everywhere, there's people, there were kids from the middle school that come in to wash dishes. Everyone was it was like a true sense of true community. And of course they asked me, what can we do? Our, our building is literally falling into the river. Um, the freezers in the back are literally going to start sliding down. Uh, so you know, this is the issues we're dealing with right now in the state. And I should get on to what I was going to say. Um, I was going to address some of the issues around our most vulnerable uh, citizens and housing. And a lot of it has to do with the with the budget, the, the administration's budget that was just introduced on March 11th, as you know, um, that Polly started to talk about a little bit. Um, it does that budget has an 18% cut in the, in the HUD across the board, and a cut like that would be catastrophic. Um, it also uh, there are cuts in the Section 8 program. That program helps. 3 million households afford rent. It is already drastically underfunded. Um, roughly only one fourth of eligible people are actually receiving Section 8 vouchers at the present time. Uh, this proposal is to cut it by 13%, raising rents and kicking struggling families out into the street. That's what it will do. Um, the budget wants to eliminate the public housing capital fund. Um, which already has an enormous shortfall, uh, and make a 38% cut to the public housing operating fund. There's currently a shortage of 7 million units for extremely low-income renters nationwide. In Vermont, there's a shortage of nearly 12,000 affordable rental homes available <laughs> for extremely low-income renters. 23% of renter households in Vermont are extremely low income. Um, there are only enough affordable homes for 35% of those households. And when I, you know, I go out and canvas, and I do see the housing stock that you're talking about, Representative Waltz, the, the just old substandard housing stock all over this state. Um, and we do not have enough affordable housing, especially for renters right now. Uh, 
also the budget would completely eliminate the Nas National Housing Trust Fund and I would like to talk a little bit about that, the trust fund. Um, it's, it's actually considered outside of the appropriations process. It's the first new federal housing production resource in a generation. This was a very exciting uh, event when this came on board. And the first targeted to help build, preserve, and rehabilitate housing for people with lowest incomes. Uh, we in Vermont can take pride of ownership in the trust fund as Bernie based the idea on Vermont's successful housing and conservation trust fund. Um, building affordable housing for very low income households through a dedicated source of revenue independent of the appropriations process. Um, and we, in, in Vermont, that source is an annual assessment of 4.2 basis points on the business of Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. Um, this year, I just learned from our DC staff, 245 million will be distributed nationally, and Vermont will receive 3 million. That's due to a very generous small state minimum um, that was included in the legislation. And even though some of the bigger states grumble a bit about the small, the small state minimum, our delegation has urged HUD to keep the formula the way it is, and so far so good with the state, three million this year. If the proposal to eliminate the National Housing Trust Fund goes through, we're, it, you know, it's, it's just, it's, we're sunk. It's a non-starter for Sen Senator Sanders, and I know for the rest of the delegation. Um, the, one of the other things I want to talk about quickly is Veterans Affairs Supported Housing. And Representative Tran, you'll be interested to hear this. Um, in the last few years, we have made important steps to address the scourge of veterans homelessness. Uh, our entire delegation is deeply committed to making sure that the men and women who put their lives on the line do not live on the streets. The 2019 budget passed with allocations of $40 million for Veterans Affairs supporting housing vouchers and $4 million for Tribal Veterans Affairs supporting housing vouchers. Uh, the Trump 2020 budget proposes to completely em eliminate both of those programs. That would be an enormous step back in the fight to end veterans homelessness. Um, the other thing is work requirements. Uh, the president has added two punitive proposals to the 2020 budget that were part of last year's legislation from HUD to cut housing benefits through rent increases and work requirements. Um, it's labeled as a way to increase family self-sufficiency, but this legislation would only jeopardize family stability, increase financial burdens, and push them deeper into poverty. Work requirements do not reduce poverty. In fact, over the long term, the most successful programs support efforts to boost the education and skills of those subject to work requirements, simply rather than simply requiring <coughs> search for work or find a job. And one good thing that came out of this budget, and an important one, uh, for health and safety is that the budget, the Office of Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Homes was, that grant was actually increased um, by 11 million from 20 million. And that, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, well, that include, um, we're, we're working on some uh, school lead uh, uh, monitoring, actually. I don't, I think it's for affordable housing. This okay. Week. I've had other people. Holly has people asking me. I have people asking okay. me about lead in schools, okay. so, and I, I'll keep looking. Okay. Um, yeah, this program has made important gains in removing lead from public housing and improving the prospects for children who live there. Um, in conclusion, the president's budget would increase evictions and homelessness as we continue to struggle with a protracted and severe housing crisis not only in Vermont, but throughout the country. Uh, those most susceptible are those most vulnerable. Seniors, people with disabilities, veterans, and families with children. 
so many of them are living in deteriorating public housing or are working to rebuild after natural disasters throughout our country. This budget will go nowhere, um, but it demonstrates the priorities of the administration and it forces advocates and policymakers like us to continually play defense rather than put together a totally comprehensive national proposal to start, solve our continuing housing crisis. And we, the Senator sends his uh, greetings to all of you, and we also will be working with you as we work with the delegation to put something together. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Representative uh, uh, On the screen behind you is the camp oh, right. brought for us. Is there anything here that um, I just, it shows, you know, like the bash, the veterans of supportive housing, zeroed out. Um, think, you know, you can just look and see the differences. Um, and also, we, you asked, talked about a couple of other things. Our office put out this. I didn't make copies for your, your paper free, right? Your yes, I was going to ask if you could uh, submit um, your comments to uh, electronically to Ron. He can sure. distribute them, uh, Great. them to all of us. Absolutely. Thank you. This is something our office put out that I was saying. Those will today. take. You'll take these? Yeah. OK. And I can <laughs> you know, make copies or ask Ron to yeah. work. Okay. I'll send it digitally. Okay. okay. Right. Thank you. Any, any, other, any questions? Very good. Thank you, Sheila. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good, morning. Good morning. Good morning. So my name is Kevin Veller, and I'm from Burlington, but I'm happy to say that I've lived in northern, central, and southern Vermont. And when you went around introducing yourselves, I bicycled through every one of your towns. <laughs> Not standard. I have. Okay. I have. Good. I'm good. I was a couple towns. I was biking, and I was looking for the town, and I realized I had biked through. Yeah, haven't even gone through it. <laughs> with my colleagues on the other side of the Congress, uh, in part because our bosses are all pulling in the same direction and we're dealing with such an important need, housing, it's such a crisis. Um, uh, I cover health. That would be Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance, um, human services, disability policy, and housing. So I like to think of it as housing and everything that goes into it. Um, What's challenging by the time I'm the third person up is what I can say that adds value to the conversation. The chart that you just put up, um, we're in the middle of the budget process. And what that means in day-to-day -day terms is that my colleagues in Washington are bombarded with about 400 uh, bills or letters, uh, recommendations that we're pouring through each and every day, trying to figure out which one is in alignment with our boss's priorities and which one are in alignment with the housing community. What makes that um, sort of winnowing through all of that uh, so much easier is that the housing community in Vermont, as Congressman Welsh says, has a very deep bench. They're incredibly knowledgeable. They, are, they collaborate, work together on complex financing, complex projects um, for a greater good doing work that private sector developers would not do. So it makes it very easy when we look at that, um, the president's budget, what's been zeroed out, to go back in and remember the ones that are the priorities and have been priorities for Vermont, the big ones, um, the ones that provide flexibility like home, um, the ones that, uh, the bigger ones um, that we can, that we're, we're, I think we're confident that a lot of the, the House budget will obviously reinstate a lot of what has been zeroed out. Um, one of the programs that isn't on uh, necessarily um, highlighted here but is important to the congressman is the bill that he introduced last year um, around PATH, which is um, a smaller program, but it addresses homelessness and preventing those who um, potentially will be homeless that have mental health issues and substance use disorder as well. Um, and we have a small state minimum that is minuscule. It's like $300,000. And it goes, and these $300,000 goes to the five um, homeless um, shelters throughout Vermont, like Good Samaritan and Barry, um, the Bradwell Drop-In Center, um, and, you know, uh, and the other ones throughout Vermont. So 
his partner in that is now a senator, which is probably good. It'll be a, a he'll, he'll be reintroducing it in the House and has a colleague in the Senate to move that forward. Um, in terms of, I mean, I think what you are looking at is, yes, housing, but then all the complex issues that impact the people in the home. You brought up the senior center, um, Medicaid. Uh, there are, if we can't address some of these things straight on, then we try to try to find ways in which to address them in other ways. So um, I just throw that out there for a dialogue. If I mean, I think I really, I think I'm coming to the part of my <laughs> presentation where I think um, it, it would be helpful to hear from you. Like, for instance, you mentioned the libraries. Um, and I know the libraries are a key component with our uh, response to the opioid epidemic because so many people who are homeless or, or, or have mental health issues, substance abuse issues, they're showing up in the libraries. And so the libraries are a touch point and a place, a, a, a part of our safety net. And the state libraries are to be commended for the way in which they're trying to address that. Uh, and we have, our delegation has supported them in a grant application recently to enhance that work that they're doing. So um, that's just one example. Uh, the schools, the congressman is really hopeful um, that we will have an infrastructure bill. And of course, there's a lot that needs to be in that infrastructure bill. Um, and so levity would be part of that. Um, weatherization. Um, that's another one where energy um, and his uh, focus on energy and the fact that we're talking about disrupting um, a whole industry in the way in which it delivers energy, um, we need federal policies that support that going forward because it's going to displace the coal miners, but it needs to uh, provide not only new ways of doing things, but economic opportunities to do solar, for example, or what have you. So. If we can't address housing straight up, we try to look for other ways in which we can address the issues. So um, we made an attempt, and we'll probably come back to it next year, but to expand weatherization into 120% um, of median income homes. Because if um, energy efficiency homes that make people, oftentimes senior citizens, more comfortable um, in their living conditions um, is a worthwhile effort. And so it didn't happen this year, uh, but um, we're thinking in terms that, uh, that we would possibly come back with it next year. So uh, no, it, it's a really important piece of aging housing stock, energy efficient buildings, comfort of our citizens all kind of wraps up together in this weatherization plan. So we're hoping that you know we might be able to uh, get somewhere on that. Um, Heat Squad is uh, an independent uh, auditing uh, um, uh, organization that comes up and they will audit um, anyone and make recommendations. And they were looking for some funding, uh, some bridge funding to take them into next year because they've got um, revenue sources that, uh, that they're hoping that build on. So that's kind of what's happening here, and I'm just hoping that um, to replace a, a relatively small amount that was taken out of Vermont's uh, budget, or at least budget proposal, uh, could be looked at from the uh, from the federal level, I suppose. Yeah, I have talked to um, Ludi in Rutland mm -hmm. about that program and sort of strategize in ways in which uh, she's done work locally in Vermont, but also I think it was Kentucky or someplace uh, yeah, was consulting, yeah. and so we were just trying to think about ways in which to, you know, take that conversation at, to the federal level and which partners would be interested in that. But it's a it's a fabulous program, and they yeah. have plenty of housing stock that needs the same yeah. thing that ours does. Yeah. Any questions? Okay, so. Just to conclude, for everyone to, to share with everyone that Medicaid reimbursement and our senior citizens yeah. is just an imperative thing. It's well, just we've got tragic. a problem there. Well, for because sure. Choices for Care is funding people to age in place. It's such a great program. It's it so cost effective. Yep. What we've got uh, a Congress that wants to um, cap Medicaid to the states, yep. not a Congress, but a. And so, 
Well, even though we can save enormous amounts of money with choices for care or um, um, SAC <laughs> or helping people with disabilities stay in their homes, saves enormous amounts of money. Un however, <coughs> they're just looking at the pot of money of Medicaid and what we in Vermont have been saying is that we want to look at the population health and extend that money into the community and do these ways that are better for all of us. And, and yet we are fighting, but have been successful in Vermont in uh, leveraging the way in which we use our Medicaid dollars. Uh, well, a report from appropriations this morning is that the half a million dollars going back into SASH or the or be recommended to um, uh, continue funding for SASH. Mm, that's so fabulous. That was good news to hear. So. Hey, great. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Ten fifteen. Ten fifteen. Okay. Break. Well, I mean, uh, we're. I can see if David can come in sooner. Okay. Now we have an amendment at ten fifteen, which is what's next. You're here. Are you on the schedule? Do you know? I'm not on the schedule, but I'm asked. For the amendment. Right, I know, that's what I thought. I realized that. So, um, is there time that we might be able to take that? Thank you. Is there time we might be able to take that? I'm sorry, I still didn't hear you. Is there time we might be able to hear from Kara? From Kara? Sure, I mean, the amendment is um, pertaining to the amendment. Yes. So it's up to you. I mean, we're, David's coming in at 10.15. Uh, Chris Rice can't make it. We hit the amendment okay. posted. Yep. We heard from the sponsor yesterday. Yep. Yep. Okay, so committee, what's your pleasure as far as? Um, and under what circumstances? And then in um, further below, in five, you're setting up a process for additional security measures. So to the extent anything in a rental agreement conflicts, this says this prevails. So if I if my lock just broke, we heard about the core, right? So if I break my key in the lock of the in the lock of the door and I call my landlord now, he can say, all right, I'll get to it when I can, as long as you can get in and out, right? As long as you can <laughs> as long as you can, you know. But but his answer can be, yeah, okay, I'll get to it. And this is is this is putting a time certain. No, so th this provision is only going to uh, come into play if it's motivated uh, in, by, in, by the sexual assault or by abuse. By the imminent harm or by the assault. So it's a narrow universe in which this procedure prevails over a lease agreement. Okay. Okay. I mean, I, I have questions about the protected tenants expense part of this, but let's go on to the next section. All right. so two and three there were the same, in case you need to refresh your memory. <clears throat> two deals with what happens if the perpetrator also is a tenant. In that case, the protected tenant has to include with the request copy of a court order that requires the perpetrator to leave the premises. And then in three, if the landlord changes the locks as requested, landlord shall provide a key to the new locks to each tenant of the dwelling unit, not counting the perpetrator who's the subject of the court order. All that's, right. that's in our bill, right? And that, those are both in your bill. Mm -hmm. So, uh, all right, so that, that's important because you know, if the landlord responds in the affirmative, what is the duty? Provide a key, do it within 48 hours, etc. So, under four, this is all different. So, if the landlord does not change the locks as requested, the protected tenant may change the locks at his or her own expense, provided that the protected tenant. So, in A, shall make a reasonable effort to obtain the landlord's permission to change the locks and provide the landlord with an opportunity to specify the type and quality of the locks and the identity of the person who will perform the work. So A is all new, 
the, the bit in line four about at his or her own, her own expense, that's new. Um, <coughs> B's, I, I've highlighted this because I replaced it in total and I renumbered it, but B you actually had, you had already said, shall ensure that the new locks and the quality of the installation equal exceed the quality of the original. Um, and you know, I, 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 I can see that as originally drafted, there, there, there could be disputes as to what that means. You know, what's the quality, the nature of the original, how do you equal or exceed it, who decides? I mean, I, I don't know if you can legislate that to death. It, it's a potential place for a problem, um, but... But that was in... A, but that was in your original, exactly. and that is an affirmative duty yes. on the protected tenant that you imposed. Okay. Right. So in C, is responsible for the costs of installation and operation of the new locks and liable for any resulting damages. So I lifted that from the piece below because this language in subdivision C applies to the security measures, to the additional security measures, but it was not previously <laughs> applicable to the lock change. <laughs> Um, D, shall notify the landlord of the change within 24 hours and provide the key to the new locks. D and E you already had. Mm -hmm. so, so the new stuff is here is explicit that it's at the protected tenant's expense. The protected tenant would have to make this reasonable effort to get not only permission but also provide the opportunity to specify type and quality of the work and the identity of the person who perform it. Um, and then C, direct responsibility not only for the cost and operation, but also liability for any resulting damages. Is that all clear as can be? So again, C already exists, yes. but with respect to security, no, C only applies right now to the additional security measures. Right, so when we say they're live, so if it reads responsible for the cost of installation and operation of the security cameras and liable for any resulting damages, that came, that kind of came up yesterday in terms of, in terms of, somebody did ask a, a question about damages on um, holes in the, yeah, so that's covering that. Um, Representative Byron. <clears throat> uh, my question was D and E. Uh, is there a timeline on the key exchange? Does that correlate with the uh, 24 hours of installation? No. <coughs> the notification is 24 hours. There's no time uh, limit on the keys. So, so the main the main thing I'm taking from this is this is that the last change? So the main thing I'm taking from this is that this is requesting. Mm -hmm some things that are seem reasonable, um, but the main thing that's happening is the that the tenant will pay for, that will pay for the expense if they're changing a lock based on an, an incident of abuse or sexual assault or stalking. There's no provision here that, there's no provision that the landlord would cover the cost at all. So the cost that Representative Leclerc was talking about yesterday, that it could be $100, it could be $1,000, is if the person who is, who is in fear and wants the locks changed, which again, they could request if they broke a key in it and the landlord would change it. Um, this is saying in an emergency situation, which is what abuse is, um, that tenant is responsible for changing the locks as long as it's for the expense of it and must use the, the section, I mean, section eight doesn't bother me so much like that's a communication thing that a landlord would be able to tell the tenant who to go to to change the lock system, but I'm, I'm concerned about the costs. But that's just me, I, I mean, I wanna hear from um, witnesses as well, so. 
Representative Gamache. Uh, so my recollection of the conversation yesterday in terms of cost has to do with uh, and, and the cost and being a tenant's expense. They are apparently there because of special lock systems. If you, if a tenant on their own changes the lock, it can severely interfere with the existing system that the landlord has. So, so the idea of this was to encourage tenants to notify the landlord and let the landlord take charge of the actual arranging for the change of locks. And in the case of a special lock system, it would only be the core that would be replaced. Right. So, and that is a fairly nominal charge. Now, the cost, as I asked uh, the representative yesterday, he said $20 about. Now, I'm sure that that does not include the actual installation charge if a locksmith did it. But he also indicated that to do that is not necessarily something that a locksmith would have to do. But as the owner of, or the, uh, the one at him, once the system is in charge, if you, he felt in his case <coughs> comfortable enough to be able to purchase the core to change it himself so that the cost would be nominal to the tenant under $30. Um, now, that may not be true in all cases. So I don't want to say that everybody, any landlord that has a special system would be able to tinker with it. But the idea behind this is if a tenant on their own fiddles with to change, uh, this system could be damaged in such a way that it would, it would cost no, I, quite I, a bit I, of money. So I, no, I hear that. I think that there's, a, there's an element, and I think David, I mean, I think whenever you testify to the word reasonable effort, you know, it's a it's a legalistic construct that basically accepts the humanity of the situation. And um, my words, but just, but again, this puts the full cost of if someone is being victimized. Mm -hmm. this, this is this is what this law is about. This isn't about I'm a flake and I lost my key. That's 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 not what this is about. This is about I'm in a really intense situation here, and I'm asking for safety. <clears throat> and, the, and the first level of safety is changing the locks. Correct. So reasonable someone who's someone who's been a victim. I mean, the landlords are victims of the crime as well under this scenario. I'm not. I'm not mm -hmm. trying to. I'm, I'm just trying to tease apart what this does. Um, and so and so someone who's under the stress of having been the victim of abuse um, asks the landlord at some point to change the locks for my own safety. Because this guy or woman who I can't trust has access. So the first level is this lock change. And the land, what this is saying is that the landlord is saying, well, you've got to call me first. You've got to make a reasonable effort to call me. You have to call me. Um, obtain the landlord's permission. Yes, you can change the locks. <clears throat> call this person. Tell them this is the core number, blah, whatever, whatever, whatever. But you have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And I think under the circumstances, is that the question that I have, is that reasonable? Mm -hmm to have the tenant who is... Well, let me play devil's advocate. Is it reasonable to expect a <coughs> to assume costs because of a tenant's need? Yes. I think so. I mean, quite frankly, um, when reasonable people are making a reasonable effort to fix this particular situation. Yes. And so it needs to be fixed. Right. And this is a very specific conversation. Representative Chinas Representative China said started to bring in a, a racial aspect of what if somebody's being you know and yeah. and he understood after we talked that, that that this bill, you know, he said, well this is pretty narrow. And it was like, well yes, it's narrow because it's about domestic violence and sexual abuse and stalking. Yeah. How would you know, there needs to be a different bill if we're going to broaden 
the way that that relationship is built. So I, I'm just trying to lay out what I'm, what I'm reading is I'm, I'm always wary of changing landlord-tenant law. I'm always wary of changing things that were fairly carefully negotiated between the advocates. Um, so the, this falls outside the bounds of normal normal stuff. Landlord tenant landlord tenant has a lease in the lease leases are can be very um, include a lot of things, but ordinary normal maintenance, let's say breakage, getting your key stuck in the lock, um, that sort of thing is normally handled by the landlord. If something breaks, I'll come and fix it or I'll make sure it gets fixed. So in this case, it's not that the landlord is saying, no, you can't do anything. The landlord is saying, yes, fine. However, I'm a little leery of what, what the cost of all of this may be, depending upon how it's handled. It's so, yeah. no, I know. And, and, and again, I think that, um, or at least I would like to think that most landlords have relationships with their tenants. And so I think that um, this kind of situation would certainly be worked out. And it's not saying that the landlord cannot bear the cost of this. And there may be many landlords who would, in the case of, for instance, changing the But that's it. This one says that they do. Um, it, Representative Hango, then Long, then Kalaki. Um, I'll bring up the question that I had yesterday. It's probably best directed to the witnesses who are in the room, but I really remember hearing somewhere that there could be emergency funds available for a victim to access to get the locks changed, and I see people nodding their heads. So I think this is almost a moot point, that if that person reported the, the abuse went to a survivor's network, and there were some funds available, they could use that money to get their locks changed if they were unable to pay for it themselves or the landlord okay. wasn't in peril to do it. Representative Wong. So just out of curiosity, when we were talking about this is about the safety and security of tenants. Um, if a landlord, and I'm not sure who to direct this to, but I'm sure this committee has feedback on this. If a landlord um, has windowsills that have tested positive for lead, um, is it not a landlord's responsibility to make sure that that is mitigated for a tenant? And, and you know, that may be much more important if a tenant has children. So I, you know, I, I, I recognize the correlation with breaking the key in there, but um, sometimes the security and safety of tenants is critical. And I mean, when we talk about need, that's a need to, and we do tenancy and take that responsibility. Representative Flack. Well, I'm. Uh... And later on, we we all had put that if it was kind of security measures, and I, it's, not, it, it, it's all to make sure the landlord understands what we're going to do, and they can't unreasonably refuse, but that the, the tenant is liable for the cost of this installation. So I'm I'm a little um, I don't know I'm a little stuck about the, the expense. Uh, this, the 48 hours and seven days actually worries me more. If someone's in crisis and lives could be in danger, I, I, I worry about the time frame of this. That you know, uh, you know, if someone was just beaten and they're, you know, they, they gotta save their life, and, and so I just. I wish we had more time to kind of go back and forth on this, but I can't support this amendment. And less on the less on the cost, but more on the time thing. I think is is that is not um, appropriate for what we're talking about. Representative Sam. Question I would want to ask as I sat here and think about it um, is. The landlord, as it's written, is given an opportunity to decide whether to change the locks or not. And what the proposed amendment says 
is that the landlord wants to refuse to change the locks, but still wants complete control over the process. And that's the part where I want to ask Representative McClair, what's, what's the rationale there? You were given the opportunity to change the locks and control it in all the ways that you wanted to. But instead you say, no, I'm not going to, and I want the tenant to do it exactly how I want. And that's the part where I would, I would want an explanation for that. It's, you, you're given the opportunity to have total control. You say, no, I don't want total control, but I do want total control. And I, those things don't. They don't make sense to me. Representative Byron. Um, I, I, I would just need some clarity on how the two different areas intersect. But if the security measures are on the cost of the tenant, with the cameras or you know window mounts or whatever, how is a lock not a security measure? It's like the first stage of security measure to a home. Or does that not fall into the same category? <coughs> Where is that again? Sorry. In the phase three is um, all the security measures if, if they want to add up additional things. But you're saying addition. that's on the tenant, so you're saying the key thing could also be on the tenant. And that's but I, I'm, I'm just kind of like trying to like toss that around because I, I'm just playing with that in my brain right now is how that can be defined if this turned into a legal yes. conversation. No, I, I, I mean, respectfully, I, I think that, <clears throat> let me, let me take you one step back. And uh, so there's, there's really three different levels here that you've created and you've created a balance sort of between the three of them. And it kind of moves in stages. First, you've given the right to terminate the tenancy. And that's just upon notice with 30 days. And you do have to provide documentation, uh, but it could be a self-certification on a form that says, I'm in imminent fear, I'm in harm, I'm in fear of imminent harm, or there was a previous sexual assault. In that case, then it delivers the paper and is out of the lease. And there's no more repercussion, there's no more cost to be incurred. Uh, it's over. So that is very strongly on the side of the tenant, obviously. Um, in the middle is this, sec this section and the first four subdivisions that relate to the locks. And that's sort of a dance. In the first stage, you make the request. You give the landlord notice. Please change the locks within 48 hours for the cause, A or B. Landlord has the opportunity to respond. If landlord doesn't respond, then tenant has a process for changing the lot. Again, it's silent on as to who bears the costs and all that, because that's something they're probably going to need to work out, right? Um, and and then the other end is uh, steps beyond that. So if one subdivisions one through four are specific to locks, subdivision five is is specific to additional security measures, including security cameras, security system, bars on the windows, whatever. In that case, the if, we're, if we're going beyond to the final stage to move additional security measures, then you've made clear, let landlord know, landlord can't unreasonably consent, but you have to pay for it, you have to arrange it, you're responsible for the liability and the function of it, um, and you have to ensure the quality, protection to the building, et cetera. So it, it, it's kind of a spectrum of protections in that way. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think the balance in each obviously is different. I don't know if that helps. So can you go back to the, um, the date changes, and then I want to bring in um, Ms. Casey to talk about their opinion on this. Um, so, letter B, within seven days, if any protected tenant was a victim of sexual assault that occurred on the premises within the six months preceding the date. So, this is about if if the person who suffered the assault, um, sexual assault, um, 
that occurred on the premises within the six months preceding. That's that's not assuming that the perpetrator leaves. That's just if something happened in March, and then in June, uh, the relationship was. I, I don't know what the seven days here. How does that work with the six months preceding? I guess. Sure. Um, well, so again, the basis of your termination or your request to change the locks could either be fear of imminent harm or something occurred on the premises in the past six months. And either you're, you think maybe you're still in danger or, you know, realistically, maybe you don't want to keep living there. Um, and Representative McClare said yesterday that he felt because if it happened six months ago, the person is dealing with it and it's more stable than a more volatile thing. And that's why he, he that representative drew a distinction to add this within seven days. Because before it was A or B was a, a triggering action. Right, right so the so the 48 hours and the seven days, that dichotomy, th those both relate to how long does the landlord have to act subsequent to the tenant's request. Right. Okay. Right. So something happened to me three months ago. Can you change the locks? And the landlord, if the landlord is going to do it under this, if the landlord is going to do it, they have seven days. That's right. If the tenant, if the landlord in that same phone conversation, if the landlord says, ah, you do it, but you got to use this person, this person, this person, and this is then, um, they can do it that day or as soon as they can get a locksmith up. This is just the situation where the, if the landlord agrees to change the lock, him or herself, then they have seven days. Yes. To have a decision. Providing, that's, that's a, they have the decision what to do. This person may have to wait seven days to have the landlord get back to Yeah, 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 yeah. Representative Hango. Or I could see another scenario with that, that um, the landlord says nothing, let me think about it, wait seven days, still says nothing, then the tenant could go and get um, the locks changed or whatever themselves. But I'm actually with um, Representative Kalaki on this, that I think the 48 hours and the seven days are too long. Um, I also feel that um, this six month business, mm -hmm. things could be going along just fine for five of those months. This is to Representative LeClaire's um, talk yesterday. And then all of a sudden something happens again. So it's not necessarily this always, this is what happened to me six months ago and I'm just thinking about it now. There could be a flare up again and um, something happens that the person, the tenant feels that maybe they're going to be in danger again. It may not be imminent fear, but I, I really think they're one and the same. And John, before I go to Randall, can you just scroll up a little bit to show subdivision two? No, the other way, right there, stuff right there. So, okay, scroll down just a little bit more so I can see the top, top of the page. I'm sorry, top of the page. No, 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 no. Uh, right there, right there. Subject to subdivision two of this subsection, which is if the perpetrator of abuse, assault, or stalking is also a tenant. So, so the protected tenant is already going to need the court order before they make this request that's in number one. Is that, am I reading that right? If the perpetrator is on the lease, then you can't lock them out unless you can, unless a court has adjudicated that that person must leave the premises. Okay. That's if they're on the lease, but if the, but if right. the person, if the protected tenant is the sole signer of the lease. Right, then you, that doesn't apply. Okay. Because this is, again, this is protection against, well, somebody's legal rights being violated under the lease and having the court adjudicate who's legally allowed to be there versus the landlord having to be in that position. Yeah. Okay. Representative Zoth, then you want? I just wanted to point out to, if I, and 
and uh, legal counsel will correct me if I'm wrong, but the bill that we passed, if, if we're uncomfortable with the 48 hours, the bill that we passed already had the 48 hour language in it. And in that instance, it applied to both of those. Right. So the seven days was the right issue. Oh, okay, but the 48 hours, did you, it, yeah. it sounded like you were uncomfortable with the 48 hour wait, and I was just pointing out that that was already in the previous one. But it hasn't passed, it hasn't passed for the reading yet. So. You know, I'm in, that's yeah. 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 Representative, yeah. come on. Yeah. So when we passed the bill and the 48 hour reference, and even in this, my take on that was, there had to be an actual action taken within 48 hours, not just I know I notify you, and now you have 48 hours in which to respond. But rather, I've notified you, and within 48 hours, this needs to be dealt with. So that that's how I responded to the the bill that we passed out, and to this also. So I don't. And so I don't know, if, but it seems like, I don't know how many other people may have interpreted that the same way. Because there's a big difference between waiting 48 hours and then taking action, because that action could result in another 48 hour wait. Take the case of getting a locksmith. They, they don't necessarily immediately respond, um, just getting hold of one, but so, so That's what, how what I you're saying is that there's two ways. Hours. What you're saying is that there's two ways of interpreting that sentence. I guess a protected tenant may request that a landlord change the locks of the dwelling unit of the protected tenant's expense within 48 hours. Like I can ask within 48 right. hours, or the reading I think that we've taken is that change. please change this within the next two days. Yes. Yes. The, the action has to be executed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so that's the and legislative intent in that sentence. Not that mother may I within forty eight hours is maybe it needs to be tweaked I, then to be a little more specific. Well let's just yeah, that may require a different one. So can I can I bring Kara in to um, talk about their thoughts on this again. Um, going back to the um, uh, Chris Rice uh, representing Angela Zakowski couldn't make it in today and has just sent an email that just said that they're that they can accept the changes that they, they didn't have any problem with the changes. Um, uh, for the record, Kara Casey from the Vermont Network Against Domestic Violence. Um, thank you for inviting me to talk about this. So I, um, I can talk about the specific um, sections in the amendment and also talk generally about what you will, um, the conversation that you will have. Um, so we, we would have an issue with uh, at the tenant's expense. Um, we all know that poverty can exacerbate um, uh, conditions that may attribute to violence and that violence can also exacerbate um, somebody's situation that when they're living in poverty. And um, so we would be opposed to um, creating any extra financial hardships on a survivor. The way that the bill exists now, um, a, if a landlord you know, cannot pay for it or you know, um, doesn't have the time to do block change, then it would go to the tenant. So we feel like it was, it was pretty balanced. Um, we, we feel like it would be creating a mandate that other tenants don't have. So as um, the chair said, if a tenant asks for a lock change for any other reason, um, I think that it would be expected that the landlord would pay for it. So for um, us to expect or to put that a survivor would, would have to pay for it, um, we feel like that would be putting um, an expectation on a, a protected tenant that isn't on other tenants. Um, and we, um, as Representative Gamash did state, um, there are uh, there are ways that a, a tenant can work with a landlord to get the lock changes paid for, and that does happen now. Um, but we do know that um, from talking with advocates that there are landlords that like to change locks um, on their own because of some of the reasons that you have stated um, that are willing to pay for it. So we feel like striking a balance between um, landlords that are able to pay for it and do want to do the work themselves and tenants that um, you know don't have the means to pay for it um, or maybe could reach out to a program 
um, and get some help or um, victims come. But we also don't want to um, put a lot into place that would kind of mandate that a survivor work with one of our programs because um, some survivors don't want to reach out to a domestic and sexual violence program. And we, um, we respect that survivor's um, choice in, in doing so or not doing so. Um, we, um, in terms of the seven day piece, we, in terms of equity, would, would like to keep the 48 hours. Um, as Representative Hango was, was talking about, we're, um, we're talking about trauma is really what we're talking about in this piece. So it could be that somebody experienced sexual violence um, on the premises two days ago, or it could be that they experienced it you know, five, five and a half months ago. And, um, and that, yeah, it's not that they're not thinking of it or just got around to calling the landlord. It's that either something happened that triggered a trauma response in that person, um, and they, they, you know, in that moment were like, okay, this is what I need to do in order to feel safe in my home. Um, it could be that the person that um, assaulted them, you know, they hadn't seen them in four months, but then that day they see them walking past their apartment, right? Um, so we feel like the, the 48 hours is, is important and may help to relieve some of the traumatic effect, effects of experiencing sexual assault. Um, and in terms of the um, subsection B, um, section A that was put in, um, I feel like asking, saying this is your, your right as a protected tenant, but then saying you have to ask permission. Um, what we're, we're saying you have to ask permission to the landlord, but the landlord can't refuse because this is your right as a tenant to have your locks changed. So I just have some questions about that. Um, and, and as stated, the landlord does already have the opportunity to change the locks um, if they have specific um, people that they want to change locks or specific quality or specific type of lock, they have the opportunity to do that in the way that the bill um, was written. Um, but we would be open to adding language that um, said that the tenant will or the tenant will make reasonable effort to inform the landlord of the intent to change the lock. So if they contacted the, ten the landlord and then you know, 24 hours went by and the landlord didn't contact them and then the 48 hour mark is coming and the landlord still hasn't contacted them or said, no, I'm not gonna do it, um, that the tenant would say, okay, my intent is to change the locks. Um, we would support if there was some language added around that. Um, not that they had to ask permission, though, but they just said yeah. Um, and then subsection 4C around, um, obviously, again, we're, we would be opposed to them being responsible for the cost um, if the landlord was doing it. Um, but we would be OK for adding language um, that said something like the tenant is liable for any resulting damages. Um, from them changing locks. And um, just to speak to the issue um, around the security, extra security measures, um, having this language and the part about the lock not having it, um, I think that our intent in um, when we were first talking about creating this bill was, you know, how can we create balance for landlords because we, we feel that they're valuable partners and obviously we need housing in order for our, our survivors to, to be housed. Um, and we feel like a, like locks and having a locked door is something that is already expected that a landlord would provide a locked door. Um, but security measures measures such as um, alarm systems or um, security cameras was not something that we currently expect that all landlords will do. So um, in asking for that, they would be asking for something that was in addition to what they would normally expect or reasonably expect a landlord to provide. And so that's why we. Um, did create those kind of extra um, um, extra pieces around a tenant paying for that and being liable for installation and damage. So, thank you <laughs> for um, clarifying. Um, so, what committee? What's on the table essentially is, and while I while I appreciate 
your willingness to talk further on language. Um, we're not, you know, I mean, the, without having everybody back at the table to hammer out details, whether someone's on a field trip or not in the building or whatever, it's very difficult for me, especially in a situation that we've treated so sensitively in terms of creating this balance. Um, I think we're, we're in a position to, we have to make a decision on whether we support this particular amendment as written and that any potential for different language really at this point going into third reading would rely on the advocates working in the Senate. It, it, that's, I mean, that's the, that's kind of the, without discounting or giving any weight to any of the testimony in terms of what would make a better bill, I think we're at the point where we think we're making a decision about this amendment um, and sending you off with with the, um, op, not with the author, but with the requester of this amendment and try to see if there's a reasonable um, alternative to some of this language. Um, that's, that's just where we are, I think. Um, rather, than, rather than delaying and writing more language, um, Representative Gamash and then Hank. Yeah, I, I was just wondering in, um, under section four, paragraph A, where it talks about the landlord's permission, so the landlord is the owner of the building, presumably the, the landlord is the owner of the building, and a tenant is not their property. And that, so what I'm wondering is Sorry. if we could tweak that, still retaining the, instead of putting, obtaining the landlord's permission, if it would require the tenant to notify the landlord of the situation and the, re and the desire to have the locks changed. It, because it, it's... I think their original bill does that. Yeah, I mean, that's the what they... This is after the landlord yes. said, no, I'm not going to do it. Or it's just not done thing. Right. Or it doesn't work. It just hasn't been done. Yeah, so can I, um, yeah, just... I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Did I interrupt that point well, completely, totally? You, well, it was just, I guess I had focused in on, I had read paragraph four. I, yeah. I read that whole thing, but I focused in on the word permission. And that that is where, in paragraph A. So I'm, I'm not, I'm wondering if there's a way of being able to just if we're in agreement, whatever we decide to, to tweak this to make to to make it. Um... Yeah, I think in, in the fact that this is an amendment to our bill makes it harder, especially without players in the room. Yeah, okay. um, it makes it very difficult to say. I don't want to speak for Representative Cle Leclerc. Right. Again, I totally respect I mean, his conversation about wanting to make sure that his the systems that he has in place are treated correctly. You know, I mean, I. I I think we all get that um, and respect, you know, an owner's right to their property. Um, but some of these changes, I, th I, I think it's, I, I, again, I think it's a conversation that's not going to end today. And the, I, I will clarify that we do not support the amendment as written. Is, is that helpful? Yes. <laughs> but that's, you know, I mean, even if there were one thing wrong, Again, without the without the sponsor of the amendment here, you know, even if there were only one thing wrong with this bill, we have to vote on this amendment. We have to vote on this amendment, you know, and without that ability to tweak it back and forth. Now, it could be up to Representative Leclerc to come back, find out what happens, reach out to Kara. They could conceivably, in the next three hours, put together something that might be reasonable. But I think the most realistic thing is that what's going to happen is that is that this will this conversation will be picked up when the bill is picked up in the Senate. And that's just a I think that's just the reality of the time and, and, and the place right now. And so um, so um, I would enter do we have a vote sheet? Um, um, 
Okay. Yeah. I was still waiting to yeah. speak. This is a welcome to reality moment for me. Um, because Ms. Casey has proposed something that I think everybody would be happy with, although I can't speak for Representative LeClaire, by adding language that the tenant would be responsible for any damages incurred as the result of a lot change if they were to be the ones changing it. So now, my question is, since we can't do that, the original bill, as we passed it out, we're only voting on this amendment here, and then on the House floor, we're voting on, if this gets voted down, we're voting on the original bill. So we passed it out of here favorably, and now in retrospect, I'm thinking that this would be a better way of going about it. And and, and so the reality is, and so the reality for you is the technical reality, or for, because it is a, it is a technical reality. Um, you are, um, you know, again without the third party here, or and third, I'm saying, the attorney and then advocates from either side, or the or the presenter of the amendment. I could foresee someone else offering an amendment that includes that language. We would still have to review it and approve it or disapprove it. Um, we just can't change this language as it stands. So if there was another, um, I mean, if there's an amendment from the committee, then like if you wanted to arrange an, a, an amendment, it would really have, I mean, it could come from you, but it would be better if it came from the committee because you're sitting on the committee. And then as a committee bill, we would report it as a committee amendment. Um, we would report on this amendment, say we didn't vote for it, and then there's this amendment, or we can do a substitute. I mean, there's a lot of different ways of, of handling it, and council can, can advise us on some of this. But, um, or again, the, the, the path of least resistance is to, I mean, again, I, I'm, I've been assured from both the Landlord Association and from the network that there's a common interest in making this bill as good as it can be, and that the intent behind the bill, the motivation behind the bill is to, not, is to keep a balance that's fair to victims of domestic, uh, domestic violence and sexual assault, and the landlords who are also victims of domestic violence and sexual assault when it, when it involves their property. I don't think that there's a, this isn't a stereotypical tenant versus landlord tug of war. And, um, and again, that's the thing I've appreciated in this conversation from the very beginning. And so um, if there is a desire, if, I mean, we still have to vote on this amendment. And if there is a desire, and the reason, I, the reason I hesitate to say we put a committee amendment forward today is that, again, we're receiving testimony from the network and not from the other right. folks who have participated in the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I, the perception of balance is probably more important than the balance itself. And so I'm, I guess I'm, we're gonna vote on this one and then just put, a, put the reality out that this is something that will be taken up further in the Senate. And, um, I'm not going to count on it coming back necessarily, but if this change is made in the Senate, if they pick up the bill in the Senate and if that change is made, then we will see that change when it comes back to us. Does that make sense for people? I'm trying not to, I'm not trying not to like sweep anything under the rug or any of the concerns under the rug. I mean, I think we've acknowledged that these things exist, but words matter. And again, we don't have the full team to, to, to work this, to hammer this out right now. So just so I understand, sure. So the Senate pick, picks this bill up. If it passes out, the Senate picks it up. They make changes. It comes back to us. Do we make additional changes, or do we just have to grapple with what the Senate? No, changed? we can make. We can accept the amendment with further amendment. Okay. There's a limitation to that. Right. Not only in time, but in process. But but yes, we would but, be able to. Okay. So at that moment, we could insert whatever. Right, what you're talking about. I just want to make sure I understand. We could, right? 
Yes, I mean, the downside of anything is that the Senate may just go, no, House's version is fine, and, and they'll pass it. I don't think that's ever happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, but also, considering that this amendment is out there, and this concern is out there, again, I just want to make sure that the folks who are, you know, are that there is a balanced conversation to move a resolution forward that, that, that keeps the balance that's in the bill. And, um, it, you know, I personally feel that, that uh, it, I think I expressed it earlier, that having the tenant, the protected tenant, be responsible for the change without there being another reasonable effort to, like, you know, for, for two for two people or two classes of people to come together and say, "Wow, this sucks. Let's work it out." Thank you for thank you for changing the law, but it does create an imbalance on its face. But as Kara mentioned, I think there is a solution that we just that Lisa was just talking about that that may work, but we're not going to get to it. We we don't have the tools to get to it today, or at least in this hour. So, asking to put off a third reading for legislative day. I don't think that does any. That I don't think that does any any good right now. Again, I think that there's enough motivation. I'm putting the faith of process on the table and saying that there's that there's enough motivation to get this right, um, and that there's time in the process to do that. So, um, I would entertain a motion on um, and, and careful of the verbiage on this um, particular. So um, we're either voting to support it or we're voting to <coughs> not support it. Um, finding a favorable or unfavorable, I believe. And so I, I entertain a motion and then we'll figure out what a yes vote is or a no vote is after that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to make a motion? Yeah, I'll move that um, we, uh, the committee move to find draft 1.1 1 .1 H132 unfavorable. So a yes vote is we do not support this bill, this amendment, and a no vote is that we support. Would you second? Yeah, we do. Okay. Second. Say that again. <laughs> the first one to vote. It's a representative hangout. Here's that other dose of reality. Yes, yes, yes. You're voting yes, 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 for it. Yes, 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 yes. You're voting. I got yes, it. Or no. Vote yeah. for it. Yes is to find this unfavorable. Okay. And when Representative Zott presents this on the floor, it's like we vote we found this this amendment unfavorable by a vote of um, so a, a yes vote is to find it unfavorable, a no vote is to support the changes presented in the amendment. Does Representative Zott get to explain why we voted it unfavorably? Uh, if well, we he's going to. Favorite. So, what's going to happen on the floor is that the uh, uh, the presenter of the of the amendment is going to, prior to third reading, uh, Representative Leclerc has an amendment, and he will do what he did yesterday. He will explain the amendment. He'll sit down. Representative Zop will come up. Will will stand and basically present. Uh, in whatever way he feels is appropriate, he'll explain the conversation that we had. He'll thank the, you know, we, we always thank the, the bringers of the amendments, and um, he'll explain the, the conversation that we just had, why we came down on the side of the um, the amendment, and what we think will happen. Um, I mean, you can provide as much or as little information as you need to, but yes, it's it's up to the it's up to Representative Scott to then explain the, the committee's. Um, Reaction to the to the amendment and then the vote and um, Thank you. All right. any further questions comments? Okay. Clerk shall commence to call the roll. Representative Walls. Yes. Representative Gonzalez is absent. Representative Long. Yes. 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 Representative Kamal. Yes. Representative. Triano? Yes. Representative Howard votes yes. Representative Kalaki? Yes. Representative Zod? Yes. Representative Byron? Yes. Representative Hangham? Yes. Representative Stevens? Yes. So, uh, Representative Zod, that'll just be. Um, uh, 
again, it's that kind of odd negative thing, you know, um, to describe as we voted. To, we voted to find this amendment unfavorable by a vote of seven zero. This is phraseology. Ten zero one. Ten zero one. Ten zero one. Yes, right. Not absolutely. Sorry. And again, I appreciate that we had this long of a conversation on this <coughs> issue. It's mm -hmm. landlord tenant law is, I, mean, I learned early on, is very sensitive to, to retain a balance and to make sure that we hear all sides of the story. And, and that's why I hesitate on, 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 I hesitated on moving this forward or suggesting that there be a further amendment done. But I think we'll work, because it's on our radar, we'll work with, um, the advocates to make sure that the language is sorted out in the future. We can do that just by checking in, and um, we're not going to we're not going to leave here in May without this being as good as it can be. Um, presumably May. Come <laughs> <laughs> on, could be April. Could be April. <laughs> yeah. Oh right, yeah. So when when the bill itself comes to the floor of the house. Presumably, it will pass and it will go to the Senate. Yes, At that point, it would be advantageous for the advocates, I presume, would consult with the Senate to see about any changes, and that would be true of any of any of the interested parties or affected parties yeah. to do the same. As you know, changes. from your experience. Yeah. Bills get passed here. Were you for it because we did our work? And the advocates <laughs> kind of put their briefcases back together and just say, "We'll fight another day." And they go to the Senate, and it starts relatively fresh from there. And so they they have their opportunities to um, to get their points across in the Senate, um, just as they've done here. So. Um, I fully assume, I fully expect to see this bill back on the side of the house by, by May. And if it, for some reason it gets hooked into some larger omnibus bill, we'll, again, we will track it and keep an eye on it through Ron or through the attorneys and we'll make sure we, we get it as right as we can. Thank you all.